The Closing In On a raid against the Utes, one of two brothers was captured. The other, alone and of his own will, stole into the Ute camp and tried to set his brother free. But he too, then, was captured. The chief of the Utes had to respect had respect for the man's bravery, and he made a bargain with him. He could carry his brother on his back and walk upon a row of greased buffalo heads without falling to the ground. Both brothers would be given horses and allowed to return in safety to their home. The man bore his brother on his back and walked upon the heads of the buffalo and kept his footing. The Ute chief was true to his word, and the brothers returned to their own people on horseback. After the fight at Palo Duro Canyon, the Kiowas came in, a few at a time, to surrender at Fort Sill. Their horses and weapons were confiscated, and they were imprisoned. In a field just west of the post, the Indian ponies were destroyed. Nearly 800 horses were killed outright. 2,000 more were sold, stolen, or given away. In the summer of 1879, Sen Piacado Horse Eating Sundance. It is indicated on the Setan calendar by the figure of a horse's head above the medicine lodge. This dance was held on Elm Fork of Red River and was so called because the buffalo had now become so scarce that the Kiowa, <clears throat> who had gone on their regular hunt the preceding winter, had found so few that they were obliged to kill and eat their ponies during the summer to save themselves from starving. This may be recorded as the date of the disappearance of the buffalo from the Kiowa country. Thenceforth, the appearance of even a single animal was a rare event. In New Mexico, the land is made of many colors. When I was a boy, I rode out over the red and yellow and purple earth to the west of Yemes Pueblo. My horse was a small red rowan, fast and easy riding. I rode among the dunes, among the base, along the bases of the mesas and cliffs, into canyons and arroyos. I came to know that country, not in the way a traveler knows the landmarks he sees in the distance, but more truly and intimately, in every season, from a thousand points of view. I know the living motion of a horse and the sound of hooves. I know what it is, on a hot day, in August or September, to ride into a bank of cold, fresh rain. Row of greased buffalo skulls. Once there was a man who owned a fine hunting horse. It was black and fast, and afraid of nothing. When it was turned upon an enemy, it charged in a straight line and struck at full speed. The man needed have no hand upon the rein. <clears throat> the man need have no hand upon the rein. But you know that man knew fear. Once during a charge, he turned that animal from its course. That was a bad thing. The hunting horse died of shame. In 1861, a sun dance was held near the Arkansas River in Kansas. As an offering to Taime, a spotted horse was, last, was left tied to a pole in the medicine lodge, where it starved to death. Later in that year, an epidemic of smallpox broke out in the tribe, and the old man, Gapiata, sacrificed one of his best horses, a fine black-eared animal, that he and his family might be spared. I like to think of old man Gapaitan and his horse. I think I know how much he loved that animal. I think I know what was going on in his mind. You will give me my life and the lives of my family. <clears throat> I will give you the life of this black-eyed horse. Mamadati was the grandson of Guaypuapo, and he was well known on that account. Now and then, Mamadati drove a team and wagon out over the plain. Once, in the early morning, he was on the way to Rainy Mountain. 
It was summer, and the grass was high, and meadowlarks were calling all around. You know, the top of the plain is smooth, and you can see a long way. There was nothing but the early morning and the land around. Then Mama Dottie heard something. Someone whistled to him. He looked up and saw the head of a little boy nearby above the grass. He stopped the horses and got down from the wagon and went to see who was there. There was no one. There was nothing. He looked for a long time, but there was nothing there. There is a single photograph of Mama Dati. He is looking past the camera and a little to one side. In his face there is calm and goodwill, strength and intelligence. His hair is drawn close to the scalp and his braids are long and wrapped with fur. He wears a kilt, fringed leggings and bearded moccasins. In his right hand there is a peyote fan. A family characteristic, the veins stand out in his hands and his hands are small and rather long. Mama Dati saw four things that were truly remarkable. This head of the child in the grass was one, and the tracks of the water beast another. Once when he walked near the pecan grove, he saw three small alligators on a log. No one had ever seen them before, and no one ever saw them again. Finally, there was this. Something had always bothered Mama Dati. A small aggravation that was never quite out of mind, like a name on the tip of the tongue. He had always wondered how it is that the mound of earth which a mole makes around the opening of its burrow is so fine. It is nearly as fine as powder, and it seems almost to have been sifted. One day, Mama Dati was sitting quietly when a mole came out of the earth. Its cheeks were puffed out as if it had been a squirrel packing nuts, looked all around for a moment, then blew the fine, dark earth out of its mouth. And this it did again and again, until there was a ring of black, powdery earth on the ground. That was a strange and meaningful thing to see. It meant that Mama Dati had got possession of a powerful medicine. Things that were truly remarkable. Mama Dati was the grandson of Guaypaco, and he got on well most of the time. But you know, one time he lost his temper. This is how it was. There were several horses in a pasture, and Mama Dati wanted to get them out. A fence ran all the way around, and there was just one gate. There was a lot of ground inside. He could not get those horses out. One of them led the others. <clears throat> Every time they were driven up to the gate, that one wheeled and ran as fast as it could to the other side. Well, that went on for a long time, and Mama Dottie burned up. Ran to the house, got his bow and arrows, the horses were running in a single file, and he shot at the one that was causing all the trouble. He missed, though, and the arrow went deep into the neck of the second horse. In the winter of 1852-53, a Pawnee boy, who had been held as a captive among the Kiowas, succeeded in running away. He took with him an especially fine hunting horse known far and wide as Guadald Seyu, or Little Red. That was the most important event of the winter. The loss of that horse was a hard thing to bear. Years ago, there was a box of bones in the barn, and I used it to go there to look, and I used to go there to look at them. Later, someone stole them, I believe. They were the bones of a horse which Mama Dati called by the name Little Red. It was a small bay, nothing much to look at, I have heard, but it was the fastest runner in that whole corner of the world. White men and Indians alike came from far and near to match their best animals against it, but it never lost a race. I have often thought about that red horse. 
There have been times when I thought I understood how it was that a man might be moved to preserve the bones of a horse and another to steal them away. The arrow went deep in the neck. Aho remembered something, a strange thing. This is how it was. You know, the Tai Mei bundle is not very big, but it is full of power. Once Aho went to see the Tai Mei keeper's wife, the two of them were sitting together, passing the time of day, when they heard an awful noise, as if a tree or some other very heavy object had fallen down. It frightened them, and they went to see what on earth it was. It was Tai Mei. Tai Mei had fallen to the floor. No one knows how it was that Tai Mei fell. Nothing seemed to have caused it, as far as anyone could see. For a time, Mamadati wore one of the grandmother bundles. This he did for his mother, Kea Dini Kea. He wore it on a string tied round his neck. Aho remembered this, that if anyone who wore a medicine bundle failed to show it the proper respect, it would grow extremely heavy around the neck. <clears throat> there was a great iron kettle which stood outside of my grandmother's house next to the south porch. It was huge and immovable, or so I thought when I was a child. I could not imagine that anyone had strength enough to lift it up. I don't know where it came from. It was always there. Rang like a bell when you struck it. And when the tips of your fingers, you could feel the black metal sing for a long time afterward. It used to catch the rainwater with which we washed our hair. East of my grandmother's house, south of the pecan grove, there is buried a woman in a beautiful dress. Mamadati used to know where she is buried, but now no one knows. If you stand on the front porch of the house and look eastward toward Carnegie, you know that the woman is buried somewhere within the range of your vision, but her grave is unmarked. She was buried in a cabinet, and she wore a beautiful dress. How beautiful it was. It was one of those fine buckskin dresses, and it was decorated with elk teeth and beadwork. That dress is still there, under the ground. Aho's high moccasins are made of the softest cream-colored skins. On each instep, there is a bright disk of beadwork, an eight-pointed red star, red and pale blue on a white field, and there are bands of beadwork at the soles and ankles. The flaps of the leggings are wide and richly ornamented with blue and red and green and white and lavender beads. East of my grandmother's house, the sun rises out of the plain. Once in his life, a man ought to concentrate his mind upon the remembered earth, I believe. He ought to give himself up to the particular landscape in his experience, to look at it from as many angles as he can, to wonder about it, to dwell upon it. He ought to imagine that he touches it with his hands at every season and listens to the sounds that are made upon it. He ought to imagine the creatures there and all the faintest motions of the wind. He ought to recollect the glare of noon and all the colors of the dawn and dusk. Epilogue. During the first hours after midnight on the morning of November 13th, 1833, it seemed that the world was coming to an end. Suddenly the stillness of the night was broken. There were brilliant flashes of light in the sky, light of such intensity that people were awakened by it. 
With the speed and density of a driving rain, stars were falling in the universe. Some were brighter than Venus. One was said to be as large as the moon. That most brilliant shower of Leonid meteors has a special place in the memory of the Kiowa people. It is among the earliest entries in the Kiowa calendars, and it marks the beginning, as it were, of the historical period in the tribal mind. In the preceding year, Taime had been stolen by a band of Osages, and although it was later returned, the loss was an almost unimaginable tragedy. And in 1837, the Kiowas made the first of their treaties with the United States. The falling stars seemed to image the sudden and violent disintegration of an old order. But indeed, the golden age of the Kiowas had been short-lived, 90 or 100 years, say, from about 1740. The culture would persist for a while and decline until about 1875, but then it would be gone, and there would be very little material evidence that it had ever been. Yet it is within the reach of memory still, though tenuously now, and moreover it is even defined in a remarkably rich and living verbal tradition which demands to be preserved for its own sake. The living memory and the verbal tradition which transcended were brought together for me once and for all in the person of Kosan. A hundred-year-old woman came to my grandmother's house one afternoon in July. Aho was dead. Mama Dati had died before I was born. There were very few Kiowas left who could remember the sun dances. Kosan was one of them. She was a grown woman when my grandparents came into the world. Her body was twisted and her face deeply lined with age. Her thin white hair was held in place by a cap of black netting though she wore braids as well, and she had but one eye. She was dressed in the manner of a Kiowa matron, a dark, full-cut dress that reached nearly to the ankles, full flowing sleeves, and a wide apron-like sash. She sat on a bench in the arbor, so concentrated in her great age that she seemed extremely small. She was quiet for a time. She might almost have been asleep. And then she began to speak and to sing. She spoke of many things. And once she spoke of the sun dance. My sisters and I were very young. That was a long time ago. Early one morning they came to wake me up. They had brought a great buffalo in from the plain. Everyone went out to see and to pray. We heard a great many voices. One man said that the lodge was almost ready. We were told to go there, and someone gave me a piece of cloth. It was very beautiful. Then I asked what I ought to do with it, and they said that I must tie it to the Thai May tree. There were other pieces of cloth on the tree, and so I put mine there as well. When the lodge frame was finished, a woman, sometimes a man, began to sing. It was like this. Everything is ready. Now the four societies must go out. They must go out and get the leaves, the branches, for the lodge. And when the branches were tied in place, again there was singing. Let the boys go out. Come on, boys. Now we must get the earth. The boys began to shout. Now they were not just ordinary boys, not all of them. They were those for whom prayers had been made, and they were dressed in different ways.
There was an old, old woman. She had something on her back. Boys went out to see. The old woman had a bag full of earth on her back. It was a certain kind of sandy earth. That is what they must have in the lodge. The dancers must dance upon the sandy earth. The old woman held a digging tool in her hand. She turned toward the south and pointed with her lips. It was like a kiss, and she began to sing. We've brought the earth. Now it is time to play. As old as I am, I still have the feeling of play. That was the beginning of the sun dance. The dancers treated themselves with buffalo medicine, and slowly they began to take their steps. And all the people were around, and they wore splendid things, beautiful buckskin and beads. The chiefs wore necklaces, and their pendants shone like the sun. There were many people, and oh, it was beautiful. That was the beginning of the sun dance. It was all for Tai Mei, you know. And it was a long time ago. It was all of this and more, a quest, a going forth upon the way to Rainy Mountain. Probably Kosan too is dead now. At times, in the quiet of evening, I think she must have wondered, dreaming, who she was. Was she become in her sleep? That old purveyor of the sacred earth, perhaps? That ancient one who, old as she was, still had the feeling of play. And in her mind at times, did she see the falling stars? Rainy Mountain Cemetery. Most is your name, the name of the dark stone. Most is your name, the name of this dark stone. Deranged in death, the minded to be inheres forever in the nominal unknown. The wake of nothing audible he hears, who listens here and now to hear your name. The early sun, red as a hunter's moon, runs in the plain. The mountain burns and shines. And silence is the long approach of noon Upon the shadow that your name defines And death this cold, black density of stone <clears throat> Most is your name, the name of this dark stone Deranged in death, the mind to be And hears forever in the nominal unknown The wake of nothing audible he hears who listens here and now to hear your name? The early sun, red as a hunter's moon, runs in the plain. The mountain burns and shines, and silence is the long approach of noon upon the shadow that your name defines, and death, this cold, black density of stone.